I'm Peter Hornberger, and I'm joined today by Stephen Kellum here with CCI and also Diane Krikora of Partner Path. All right, so let's dive in. Here's a glance at our agenda today. We're going to start with an introduction to uh, the two topics we're going to cover in this webinar series. This is the first of, uh, of a series that we're starting today. And then we're going to dive into today's, today's topic, which is scorecarding. So as I mentioned, this is the first in a two-part series. Our first webinar is going to be on scorecarding. That's today. And then our next uh, webinar is going to be on business planning. That's coming uh, on December 11th. These are two closely, closely related topics, but different ways of measuring partner performance and engaging and growing and evolving together with your partners. We chose to tackle them in this order uh, specifically because we feel that a lot of uh, the metrics that we're going to be talking about today in scorecarding are things that you may have the data available already. You simply need to take it and mine it and, uh, and display it in a format where you actually have a scorecard versus business planning is generally a much more involved process where you need to meet with your partners, align your goals, and make plans for coming quarters and coming years so that you can sell and grow more effectively together. So um, we thought it would make sense to start with scorecarding because that's something a lot of people can get rolling on very quickly and very easily, whereas business planning is something that takes um, is kind of a long rolling cycle to grow into. And so scorecarding is a great foundation for growing into business planning over time. Here's a brief look at CCI and what we do. Um, we really uh, we focus on channel programs, and we believe that every program should have three main components for su for success. Uh, up front, we there needs to be expert guidance um, that's going to build and design programs, give clear objectives, and involve uh, best practices and thought leadership. There needs to be some form of an application and way to communicate and uh, and connect with partners on the different types of programs that you're running. And then you need services. There's a lot of back-end support that goes into uh, supporting these kinds of programs. So CCI focuses on these three main areas. This is a glance at some of the clients that we have as well. We work a lot in the high-tech space and the telco space um, and a little bit into manufacturing and green tech as well. And the main common thread that weaves through all these customers of ours is that they are they are clients who have dedicated themselves to their channel. They are dedicated to growing their businesses through their channel, and, uh, and, and programs are a big part of that. And scorecarding is a discussion that we're having with nearly all of these clients on a regular basis. Diane, I'll pass over to you let you tell us a little bit about Partner Path. Thank you, Peter, for having me join you guys today. We actually share quite a few clients, as you guys will see. For those of you unfamiliar with Partner Path, we work with technology clients exclusively to help elevate the impact of partnering. We look at it holistically with our designing partner programs, implementing them, so the, the tactics, the, the um, materials, so to speak, and then also some automation tools around um, things like deal registration. We also look at our clients and, and the industry along a partner maturity model which you can see here. We'll talk a little bit about it later as well. But we like to see organizations as they grow from being partnering novices up to a partner-centric uh, organization where 80% of their revenues are really driven by partners. We work with them at each stage to help address some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that they face as they become a more partner-centric company. For those of you who don't know, there are about 42 of us. We are global, and we've been in business for 15 years. Again, Peter and Steve, thanks for having me join you guys today. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. We're, uh, we're glad to have you. So then let's go ahead and dive into it. Our, our first section, Stephen's going to take us through. And, uh, and this section is really about utilizing and maximizing the dollars you're spending in the channel. Stephen, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, to me, this is a fascinating subject, and it is something that I hear about and uh, have discussions on a regular basis in, in many different areas. It's not just uh, on the quarterly business reviews with our existing clients or in conversations with future prospects. However, almost all of those conversations at some point get down to scorecarding because everyone's trying to get the most out of what their, what their spend is. And so many people are moving to discretionary uh, income, uh, discretionary programs or growing their programs or adding new products that 
identifying the right partners is huge in understanding how to spend their, their dollars wisely. To me, the interesting piece beyond uh, the day-to-day -day on this is even at seminars, roundtables, discussions that may be about partner enablement or may be about um, a lead generation and really even into the marketing side of things, scorecarding comes into the conversation somewhere along in e each one of these. Uh, I did a presentation at a conference last, uh, last May and the most popular request out of uh, the, um, the whole presentation, and the presentation was really about best practices that are going on in the industry very broadly, was around scorecarding. What everyone was looking for is, hey, can you give me the top ten list of scorecarding that you see? And Diane's in a great spot for this. We're in a great spot th for this because we, we talk and we listen to so many people and we hear the challenges that are going on in the market on how to spend these funds wisely. And once again, so much of it comes down to how are we identifying, how are we measuring these partners. So it's a fascinating topic. I think it's an underlying linchpin for, for so much. I broke this slide down into three pieces and I thought it was just kind of simple to go through it this way. Uh, in today's market, every dollar counts. And not that it didn't before, but I would say every dollar is measured and people are held so accountable even in the marketing side of things today. Uh, we've had several conversations where marketing people have uh, dollar quotas. I mean, the lift has got to be measurable. That Everything they're doing has to have a measurable return. And a key to that, in particular in a growth market or trying to take market share or evolving with new products that are out there, is you've got to have the right partners. So to me, it, it so much starts, starts there. And the scorecarding and scorecarding in an organized, process-driven fashion is just so important to, to making that happen. Uh, so the dollars are important. Uh, with the complexities that are out there now for partners, there's so many requirements upon partners. Uh, many of them may be started as a, a break fix and then turn into a managed service provider, and they're also a solutions provider. Uh, they're doing so much more in so many cases than they w were before. Really need to identify not just the ones who want to do well, but the ones who are positioned to do well. Uh, the other big piece I really think is we are seeing a movement from co-op to MDF, and one of the reasons we're seeing that, the resurgence, is so much out there, so many conversations out there about whether co-op has become an entitlement. I think that's part of it. I think the bigger piece that I hear on a regular basis is vendors are looking for partners that can take market share, or they're looking for partners that can grow. So they want to use these discretionary funds that are generally tied to business development, market development funds, business development funds. So to do that, uh, they need to know who are those right partners to spend that money on. The upside of MDF is, hey, it's great for business development. The downside historically for MDF is it's a challenge to measure. How do we get that lift? Uh, how do we measure that lift? And that's, a, that's a whole separate, uh, that's a whole separate uh, webinar. But to me, the, the key is are, as you're moving from, say, if you're moving to that co-op or MDF, or if you're increasing that MDF, how do you make sure that you're uh, rewarding the right partners with those dollars? Okay. Next slide, Peter. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. So then um, moving on to our next section, Diane's going to take us through uh, the factors for building a scorecard that's specific to your business's goals and objectives. Diane? Thanks, Peter. And what, we're, what we're really talking about here is we're looking at measuring partner performance and or the potential of a partner. And that's really kind of how Peter set this up, between the difference between scorecarding and business planning. We're in scorecarding, we're, we're, we're looking at what is the performance or what has this individual partner performed for us in the past? Are they doing well? Or is, what's the potential for them to perform in the future? And business planning, just to set that up, is you're really designing the partnership together. What are the gives and takes? How are you each going to put this relationship together and continue to grow it? So when we're talking about scorecards, and when we're looking at, at how to use scorecard or what are our clients' scorecards, the first thing we're always talking about is what's the plan? 
before you start like running and gathering numbers, which we're going to talk about um, today, really we're going to focus on the ten metrics that you might want to gather in the scorecard. Why? What's the plan? Why are you scorecarding? Is it performance? Are you measuring who's performed well for you? Are you measuring potential? Why, you know, what's the whole goal? Are you look, trying to raise the awareness of those partners within your organization? Are you looking to give them more resources? Are you looking to promote them to different levels? Why are you, why are you bothering, right, is the first question. Why are you doing this? And the second um, in building your plan, who, which partners? Are you only scorecarding your top performers, your gold partners, your platinum or your titanium partners? Are you scorecarding growth partners? Are you looking at some that are in a particular region or those that are through, you know, managed through distribution, uh, scorecarding two sets of distributor partners off of each other. You know, who are you really looking at um, that goes along with, along with the why? What are you trying to do and who? The when, we have a lot of discussions on when. When do you start scorecarding? Right after they've um, ramped or right after they've been onboarded? Is it a year? after they've engaged with you, right? If you're measuring performance or are you measuring potential, when are you, when in your relationship are you scorecarding them? Uh, is, you know, are, is it take two years to be truly productive with you and your products? Are you that complex? Are you SAP or IBM where it really takes that long to, to, to understand and get, get your wheels underneath you as a, as a partner? And then we kind of move into two that go together. How and how often? How are you scorecarding these guys? Uh, is it a survey? Is it a third party? Is it your own uh, partner account managers? Are you asking distribution to help you in terms of the, these metrics that we're going to talk about, which is the what on the end? How often? Yearly? Quarterly? Semi-annually? At your partner conference? At a, at a partner advisory council? How often You know, are, are you really going to do this? So, Look at the plan because there's a lot of resources. Even if you're going to be gathering data from your own system, like I'm a data girl. I love to look at a lot of data and a lot of charts. But the, the question is really why, when, how, and how often? Uh, and be able to set the plan because as you're starting to gather this data, these questions are going to come up from your executive team. We will get to the what. Trust me, that's most, most of the conversation today is on what are the scorecarding metrics that we look at. And then as you're, as you're just a little one more slide, as you're building this plan that I just talked about, these are some of the things that you should consider as you're building that plan. Uh, we kind of talked about why, but more specifically, what are your goals? Are we driving different value elements um, in, in your partnerships? Are you looking, for, for example, are you looking to increase services, uh, the service attach rate or the amount of services your partners are doing? Are you, are you just looking to grow revenue? And I, and I put just in finger quotes because certainly revenue is a great reason to want a scorecard and understand your partners. Are you growing or expanding into new markets? Kind of what is your overall goal and there are some things that feed those goals. I talked a little bit about that partnering maturity model. Where are you in, in an overall mature partner structure within your company? Do you guys consider yourself a novice organization around partnerships? Are you a channel-centric company? Are you, you know, 80% of your revenues being driven by your partners? Not just fulfilled, but driven. Because at different stages in that maturity model, you're going to have different goals with your partners, and you're going to have different reasons to go, go do all this scorecarding and gather this information. Another piece that goes into your goals and to this plan is customer segment. What customer segment are these partners that you're going to scorecard targeting? Are you looking at consumers? Are, are we looking at, you know, Best Buy and Staples as your know, partners that you're going to be scorecarding because there's going to be different metrics that you're going to at, at, that you're going to want to focus on if it's consumer versus an enterprise or a small business partners. These partners have not only different metrics 
the different levels of those of those metrics, right? In terms of overall revenue or number of technology um, certifications and some of those. So you're going to have different expectations on your partner base. So make sure that if you're measuring them against a yardstick in terms of performance and saying are they good, are they bad, are they worthy of more attention and focus to us, that that you're that you're reasonable and you're comparing like partners. Don't put your small business partners or those that sell the small business up against those partners that sell the enterprise. Make sure that, that you've got different metrics for them. That also goes along with kind of the types of partners. Uh, are you measuring or evaluating? Are they, and types of partners being, are they reselling for you? Are, or are they referral partners? Are they ISVs or your alliance, your big strategic alliance partners? Do they just, are they consultants uh, that, that recommend your, your products and services? And each one of those partner types are totally acceptable for scorecarding. Again, not only the metrics, but the measures may differ as you're looking at performance and or potential. Last but not least into this kind of whole goals is the idea of cloud. I know, I thought I'd get through a whole hour today without saying the word cloud. <laughs> where are you and where is cloud adoption in your priority? There is a different partner business model for cloud. So you're going to naturally measure different things. You're going to look at um, subscriptions and, and managed services rather than resale. So that's a, that tends to be a, kind of a big question when we're looking at plans and goals and at the things that you kind of consider as you're setting up what is a scorecard, how often do we do that scorecard, who looks at it, is this goes to our executive team, is this a management level thing, or is it a a day-to-day -day, um, execution or in or operations oriented thing. So those are just some ideas of things that we look at and I and I know you guys are probably swimming now saying, wow, that's that's a lot to think about. But it'll all be clear in the, within the next thirty minutes. Great, thanks Diane. So then as Stephen and Diane both alluded to, I think the most commonly uh, asked question when we get into these discussions surrounding scorecards are, are, are people say, great, I understand I need a scorecard. <laughs> what do I put on my scorecard? And so uh, real practically today, we've gone ahead and built out the top 10 scorecarding metrics that we think should and can be included on a scorecard. And we've actually gone ahead and laid these across a, uh, a two by two matrix to kind of give you an idea of how easy or hard these particular metrics are to get and how powerful they can be. And depending on which matrix they fall in, it should give you a better idea of what can you get rolling on now, what are some things that you need to put out as goals and, and, uh, and things that you need to work to actually obtain in the future, and which ones are worth putting that work in and which ones are ones that um, you can save for, uh, for a later date. So we're going to actually walk through this uh, through each section on the matrix. and. Uh, yeah, yeah, Peter, the only thing I wanted to add to that is um, that all of these are important. Uh, we had to figure out how to put them on a quadrant, right? And it, it comes down to, in your top ten, they're all very valuable, but some, as Peter said and as Diane said, are going to be more important than others. And a lot of it is going to depend on what industry you're in, what type of partners you had. Uh, so much of what Diane stated, a lot of the whys and the whats and the hows. Um, I, what we wanted to be able to provide was here's a process, right? Here's a list of the top ten, and we can go beyond that top ten at some point as well. We actually started with the top ten a while back. It turned into top 20. And we went, well, that'd be, that's going to be a two-and-a-half-hour webinar, so let's take, let, let, let's take it down. But we wanted to take those top ten and create that process of which – you guys, as vendors, can step through and go, uh, maybe this step is more important than, than the other one. And every consultant likes a two-by-two two matrix. So well, I was going to let you say that, all right? <laughs> so the first, uh, the first section of this quadrant we wanted to go through was, uh, was the metrics that are easy to get and, uh, and what we consider less powerful. Uh, and, you know, and I'm going to jump in here just to start, Peter, and, and part of it is the reason I wanted to jump in is my background is very much in, well, it's both in the sales side through the channel and the sales management, but also a very interesting stint in the partner side running an IT company. And uh, starting with the total sales revenue side of things, 
Obviously, it's important, and it's what we hear everyone does. The big thing that we hear now uh, so much is uh, if you're looking for rising stars, it's hard to just look at total revenue and really get what you're looking for. If you're trying to move more silvers to golds, more golds to platinums, all your golds to platinums, trying to find those guys who are going to be your stars of tomorrow. Uh, Diane mentioned cloud, right? Uh, who's going to be the best one there? It may not be the revenue dollars that are the indicator right now. It may be a trend in there, but I think a lot of the other scorecarding pieces as we go through this, I think are you going to see are going to be very important when they're laid up against that. On the uh, technology expertise side, I think you start to get into the color here of, of, of who that vendor is. And something to keep in mind, I think sometimes we in this space take the technology expertise and even the operational efficiencies a, a little bit for granted. The effort it takes for partners to get techs certified and really become experts and get their salespeople certified too is a real challenge because salespeople at partners are coin operated. They want to make money. Uh, techs at uh, partners are, and technology people are designed to, to fix things. Getting them to take the time to go through your processes to get really certified, um, I think says an awful lot about how committed a, a partner is. And I know we have this in the easy to get and the less powerful side of things, but I do believe you're starting to get some really good color from information that you have readily at, at your fingertips. Um, Diane, any, any, uh, any thoughts yeah. on that? Well, certainly, and, and I don't want, we don't want anybody to think that these are, you know, the, the, they're less powerful, they're less impactful, but these are all data elements that you guys should be able to pull from your system without, with little or no investment, you know, or engagement from the partner. These are, these are all things that you'll have in, in your partner database systems, and technology expertise is something that this industry has hung uh, their hat on for quite a long time, and it leads will lead to one of the things that y you probably saw on the last slide up into the top right corner, which is customer satisfaction. We always uh, hold uh, technology expertise as a direct link into customer satisfaction, because if the partner is able to uh, accurately sell, install, and manage your solutions. The customers are going to be more happy with that, that your overall overall solution. And certainly, um, we're, we're seeing that going to diminish a little bit in terms of a measure of how good a partner is as we kind of move more into cloud and more adoption of cloud because the, the service is delivered by the vendor. But that's still one of the things that uh, uh, we kind of really hang our hat on. And then the next one, uh, um, operational efficiency, is um, just some easier, easy, easier than some of these metrics. I don't know if you guys got a good look at that overall, that overall table. The last one, easier than some of these metrics, but again, less impactful for a, a true measurement around performance and/or potential than some of the business. Uh, scorecarding stuff that we have up on the upper top. Okay. Great. Thanks, guys. So then the next quadrant we're going to look at is the metrics that are still easy to get, but, uh, you know, we classify it as more powerful on this, on this uh, sliding scale. Uh, and, and, I, and I believe this, uh, the Mindshare one is, uh, can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Uh, and the challenge today is, so many vendors are sharing uh, across groups of partners. And it was an interesting uh, comment in a seminar the other day, is, um, why should we spend time doing this and enabling partners? Well, because if you're not, somebody else is, uh, because there is uh, so much overlap in, in partners. We did a, we did a study, and uh, Diane has done this too, and we've seen on average that over 60% of partners have 15 plus vendors that they have relationships with. Uh, we talked with a partner who receives an average of 200 emails daily from their top 10 vendors. So th there's no question that partners, as uh, there is somewhat consolidation or as they move through, as Diane said, either to the cloud or whatever, whatever they may be um, moving into, uh, they have an awful lot of, uh, of irons in the fire. And Mindshare is incredibly important 
And then the, the reason being is, uh, tying back even to what Diane was talking about earlier on, if, if you're really looking at revenue growth, uh, they can only focus on so many aspects at one time. So uh, I, I think it's absolutely, absolutely key. Yeah, and I'd love to jump in on mind share or engagement. We also, you guys call this is what we call it, share, you know, even share of wallet. Right? How much of the partner's share of wallet um, are, are you getting as a vendor? Are, and we look at it really around um, capacity as well, uh, number of competing vendors that, you know, that they're, they're carrying. If you're one of 200 partners, you're really not going to get a lot of that, that mind share. And if you're, but if they're a $20 million company and 80% of their business of a 20, as a $20 million solution provider is of your product, you're also not going to grow that much with them. So the potential for growth is in there. There might be high performance. You have a huge percentage of their wallet, but the potential, the growth isn't there. So that's kind of where we kind of balance back between scorecarding and then the topic of next webinar, which is business planning. Okay. Uh, the, um, thanks, Sam. The, the sales metrics, obviously we're getting a little bit into more detail here and we're getting a better idea of um, – of what the partner's doing. Now, some of this uh, can be uh, gleaned from programs that you're running. And we're starting to get to uh, away from things that may be absolutely at your fingertips always to uh, metrics that either you need to engage with the partner on or have a program that's going to going to basically produce this sort of metrics. They're pretty powerful, but uh, there definitely is uh, a, a little more engagement involved. And then when you get to the current business model, to me, I think this is an absolute key. It seems like a basic idea, but if a partner can articulate what they're doing well now, I, I, it's definitely a window into the future of, of where they're going to go and what their next business model is going to be. Because the guys that are really good are trying to figure out, you know, what, what is my five-year game plan on this and where am I going to go? However, the, the challenge is there's also a lot of partners out there who um, have a, an idea from getting to point A to point B, but they don't have a plan on getting from point A to point B, and it's really good to undercover, uh, discover and uncover you know, who are the real folks who have these uh, business models in place and who are the ones uh, that, that don't. Yeah, and with these, um, we still call them relatively easy to get. These, you'll need more robust or advanced systems to get to get these data to get this data. But many of our many companies out there collecting this type of um, data, particularly the sales metrics, even beyond total seven, uh, total revenue, deal registration systems certainly can help provide uh, a window into those kinds of metrics. And the, the, their, the business model would be something that you could collect through partner profiling system. So it, it is a little bit more advanced topic than the stuff that we've seen last, but we can still get them through um, many of the kind of systems pieces. The current business model, I think, is, is as we kind of start moving towards the uh, uh, more powerful edges, you'll see when we show the, the overall Two by two matrix again. This is this is on the this is on the edge of something that's really a predictor for performance and potential. Great, thanks, guys. So then let's move uh, up the scale a little bit to the metrics that are harder to get. We'll start on the on the left side. So metrics that are hard to get and and what we would classify as a little bit less powerful, less impactful. Uh -huh. So, yeah, you know, I have kind of – Diane, I'm interested in your take on this one, on the vertical expertise. I have a little bit of a mixed emotions on this one. Uh, to me, I think it is incredibly important to certain vendors who are focusing on enabling uh, their partners to be very successful and be specialists. Uh, what I – the challenge that I saw was uh, often uh, being able to validate – does that partner actually have that expertise? It, to me, it kind of goes back to the same thing. It, they have a desire or a focus to work in a particular vertical. Are they really investing in that from an education, from a marketing uh, perspective? And, 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 and uh, is the enablement there to, to make them successful in that? 
Yeah, it is. Am- I agree. It is amazing how many partners uh, tell us that they have a expertise in um, the financial because they they did the the technology systems or the network for a bank in Connecticut. Now we're Magically, yeah. we are vertical. We are no wait, Diane. They have a one sheet. They have a one sheet yeah. that says it right. Uh, they, they 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 did one and they wrote that up as a success story. And now they have that vertical expertise, and um, and we see that a lot in the kind of the profiling aspects and asking partners, you know, where they're where they have a vertical focus and they check all the boxes, especially those those partners that are sub $50, $50 million in overall annual revenue. They're small businesses themselves. They're going to grab everything that they can get, uh, you know, in in their patch. They're more territory-focused than vertical. They're, no, I don't mean to say that there are not vertically-focused partners, particularly that are small. There are. We know quite a few in the in the legal world, particularly. You know, lawyers may have specific needs or healthcare may have specific needs, but generally – when you've got 60,000 partners in your ecosystem and they're saying that they've got vertical expertise, it's very, very hard to validate that. And some of this some of this data that you're sharing here, you can get from distribution and, and validated by your uh, distributor partners and, you know, from the partners themselves. And it's, a, it's just a little bit harder to truly validate their vertical market expertise. And, and what do you put there? Is that three times they've had to work for, do work for a bank before they have a financial expertise? Is that seven hospitals? Kind of what, what is your benchmark or what is that measure that that metric is going to cover? Yeah, and I think that goes, you know, aligned with what you're, as a vendor, your key verticals, right? And I, I think the short of that is just ask the right questions. And it'll be interesting to see the partners who really are in that vertical expertise will ask certain questions. They will ask, I, I want funded headcount in, uh, in, in this particular area, in this particular vertical. I want this kind of demo equipment. I want this sort of sales training. Uh, you don't have to dig too deep to see uh, who the partners are that I think are asking the right questions in that. Okay, and then the company health. Uh, for, for me, the company health is, is interesting as well, too, because you're getting down to things that are uh, a little more sensitive questions. Um, they're important to have as data points, uh, but there's a couple of pluses and minuses to this, too. It depends on, from my perspective, what you're trying to accomplish uh, on its own, just looking at the company health, uh, it is one indicator of where a company stands today. The, the things we have to be careful of is uh, not to be uh, too knee-jerk to this and look at what a track history uh, is of a partner, uh, what their business plan is. Have they changed their business model? I, I know organizations that have moved from uh, one uh, model to another model, and you know, they went from uh, needing uh, demos and support from the vendors, the most important thing, to needing cash flow as the most important thing if they went into a more, uh, uh, more capital uh, expense-intensive uh, business model. So I, I think this is incredibly important, incredibly powerful. Uh, my caution always on this is just make sure it's in context. I would agree, and, and to us, it really aligns with that plan or those goals. Like time in business, if they're a thin, they've been in business for 40 years, that could be great because they've got a great track record. They have a, a, probably an awesome team that has been around for 20 years. They're a well-oiled operational machine. However, if, you move, if your goal is to move to the cloud, that might not be your best partner, right? somebody that's been a reseller for 40 years. I'm not saying they're not, but, but just the, these kind of metrics, particularly around company health or uh, cash flow, uh, credit line, things as they start to move towards a cloud-based model really changes their overall business. So just hold, hold these up, any of these ones that are kind of in this, um, kind of harder to get area before you go diving down them, hold them up against those goals um, that, that really why are you scorecarding and, and what are you trying to get out of it and who are you looking for performance and if you are, performance to what or are you looking for their potential the potential in cloud um, then you're going to have different numbers for each of these things 
Yeah, I think, Diane, I think that segues really well into the next one. Sure. So our final quadrant is the metrics that are hard to get and more impactful. Right. That, that teacher business plan, uh, Diane, I think you that was very, uh, uh, very to the point of you've got perhaps that 40-year business that uh, are they going to move to the cloud, uh, a desire to move to the cloud, fantastic. Uh, but when you're moving from, you know, 80% of your revenues being uh, up front to uh, smaller but a long-term uh, recurring revenue stream, uh, when you're looking at uh, changing your sales force from uh, having sold uh, boxes to selling risk mitigation and business continuity, uh, all of these pieces, uh, and, and from marketing, right, and perhaps they have a vertical that they're going to focus on, all of these pieces to me are so key in the business plan, and we're de we've definitely moved way to the right on, uh, the, on, on this quadrant on the idea of uh, your engagement with the partner at this point. This is a future business plan where you're aligning your go-to-market strategies. And it can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Yeah, and this, this piece, this, their business plan really, you, in, still in scorecarding, before we get to next month's topic of business planning, still in score, the scorecarding helps you understand um, and really measure that, that partner performance. Uh, these are both of these, the end user satisfaction and the partner's vision of their own business really helps uh, you understand, are, are, is this a partner that I want to throw more resources around? Are these, um, many of you on the phone manage these guys on a, on a daily basis, right? <clears throat> Understanding and <clears throat> having the conversation with a partner about where they're going They've got five and ten year plans out there. Services business tends to really need to focus that far out because they're making long term investments around people and training and some of that vertical market expertise that we talked about and those technical certifications that we talked about in the first slide. So understanding where they're going and again these are these aren't easy to get. There's these there's these conversations are sitting down. This isn't necessarily something they're gonna throw over the the transom to you. And then same with the end user satisfaction, really great metrics. Yeah, the end user uh, satisfaction is really near and dear to my heart. I, you know, I've talked to partners who uh, look at this in uh, two different areas perhaps. If they're running a help desk, uh, these guys have some major challenges, right? If a partner is trying to really cares about uh, where they're going to go and growth and they're looking for referrals to sell more product into, uh, that is how they want to grow. Um, the challenge they have on end user satisfaction is on a help desk in particular, you get two kinds of responses. People that are really, really happy, beyond the norm, and that's usually a fairly small group, or people who are really, really ticked off about something. And they tend to get very, very bipolar responses on this. So when we're looking at end user satisfaction for, for partners, uh, I think you really have to break it down into uh, different segments. And, and as we move into cloud services and it's more consulting, it's more business, it's even different there. Uh, versus the traditional uh, professional services project where if a partner scores, you know, 99 plus, then uh, that's added to their sales revenues and they get a 10% uh, uh, 10 percent discount in, uh, in in their pricing. But those are two very, very different ways of, of looking at it. And as Diane has mentioned several times, as you move to the cloud, these are going to change. But, but I love this. When you've got a partner who really cares about their end-user satisfaction piece, to me, this, this is where you have health in a partner, and they're thinking about the right thing, and the rest of it can move along with it because they're going to represent you really well because they're representing themselves really well. Sorry, I'm a little passionate about that one, Diane. No, that's, that's great. I have, you're perfect right on. I got nothing to add to that one. Okay. I, I absolutely agree. Okay. Great. Well, thanks, Stephen and Diane. So then in, uh, in recap and summary, one of the things uh, I wanted to touch on briefly was the importance of, uh, of if you can do all the things on this top ten list of scorecarding, great. You're, you're way ahead of the game. More than likely, you, you can't do all of them yet, and, and it's something that you have to build towards. And one of the important things in figuring out how you're going to build towards getting a, 
a bulked out scorecard that it contains all 10 of these items is looking at your particular business. What space do you play in? What are your goals and objectives? What are important? And that's going to be very different depending on, on who you are and where you are. And Stephen and Diane have touched on this a little bit depending on, um, you know, if we talk about the tech space, are you a software company? Are you a hardware company? Even if you're a software company, maybe you're moving towards the cloud, maybe you're not. Um, and, and all of those are going to be factors in determining which of these top 10 scorecarding items are the most important to you. For software companies, maybe it's 1, 4, and 7. For a hardware company, maybe it's 2, 5, and 10. Those are just examples, but what you want to do is take a look and say, okay, what are these, which metrics are going to be most applicable to me? And maybe take your top five or your top three and say, these are the ones I want to roll out in the coming future. And then go over and take a look at this, uh, at this matrix again and say, okay, which ones of these do I have the information to just start doing today? Which ones of these can I go look up the numbers in my system and get rolling on the easy to get ones? Um, and then which are the ones that I need to, to build towards and set a goal for and actually, um, you know, begin collecting data and communicating with my partners to get that information. And then lastly, we just wanted to put these all on one list for you. This is the order that we went through them, and we've got some of the examples and bullet points under them as well. So a, a good list for you guys to just uh, take away from here. And with that, we wanted to move in. I know we've got, uh, looks like just about three or four minutes left on this webinar. So wanted to move, it looks like we've got a few questions to answer. So let me pull these up and we'll read them out. The first question, I think, Diane, this is probably going to be uh, for you, is how do you measure share of wallet? That's a concept you had brought up earlier. Yeah, sorry, I threw that one out there for you guys. Um, <laughs> sorry. Share of wallet is, it's, not an easy it's not in those easy things to measure it's definitely in the higher things to measure. but what you're looking for is what percentage of your of the are you as a vendor of your partner's overall revenue you're looking then that's kind of the definition of the term of share of wallet if they again if they are 20 million dollar or if they sell 20 million dollars a year in revenues are you 10 of that 50% share of wallet, or are you 10% share of wallet, or are you 1%? So how much of their, it went into the mind share conversation. How, how much mind share do you have based upon a revenue number? So it is literally, they are a $20 million company, and every year they sell $10 million of our stuff, 50% share of wallet. You know, Diane, I think what's really interesting, too, is ask a partner sometimes this, because the really good partners are asking this of their end users, uh, because uh, they're in a competitive environment as well. And as you describe it, it it's very, very uh, analogous, and it's always a great question to ask a partner. And some of them, the light bulb is on on that, and, and, and some of them go, oh, my gosh, I, I never even thought of it that way. And, and we say if you're not 10% of their share of wallet, you're going to have a hard time getting a mind share, right? That their salespeople in training, their technical people to training, you know, the, the some of the – they're not necessarily proactively selling you if you're not somewhere around at least 10%. They are reactively, you know, they've got – they may have 100 vendors on their line card. If they're a big com if they're a big partner, if you got to be in that top 10% of their overall revenue for them to be setting up and taking notice. That's great, thanks guys. Uh, so one more question before we close. Uh, question says, I want a scorecard, but I have limited resource. What's going to be the most effective way to do this without a lot of people to to get this rolling? Um, Diane, you want to <laughs> you want to take that one? Um, yeah, that, that's the hard part, right, uh, limited resources. Certainly, without a lot of people, the best way to get this rolling is through the systems, right? Um, what data, understand what data you already have, uh, you know, what, where you might be able to even outsource to CCI to get some of that data. How, how can you um, use without making a lot of phone calls or, or serving your, surveying your partners, where can you, can you leverage a distribution? Where can you get, you know, what data elements do you have? And start with a scorecard that you already know that you can find the data for. 
Great. Thanks, Dan. So we're out of time, so we will get back to any of the other questions that were asked. We've also got our, uh, our email addresses up here on the, uh, on the screen if you want to reach out to us directly. More than happy to answer your questions. There will be a recording of this webinar available here at the same link that you came to. Um, should be up in just a few minutes after we close this down. So, Diane, thank you very much for joining us today. Your, uh, your expertise and input was, uh, was great. Very nice to have you and, uh, and do this webinar with you. And thank you everyone for attending and we will uh, we'll see you hopefully on December 11th for the business planning webinar. Thank you everybody. Thanks Peter. Thanks Stephen. Have a nice day.